The idea is like they see themselves in the mask. I could be shot, I could be killed right now. My life could end. I mean, it changed my entire life in a way that can never go back and fix it. And I wish I could. Now a North Texas security guard is accused of hacking into a hospital's computers and posting video of it on YouTube. It's Ghost Exodus. You're on a mission with me, infiltration. And there it goes, it's melted. The endorphin rush is like jackpotting and, and slot machines, like every hack is like is addiction. It's consumed all my peers. I was the first person in recent US history who was ever convicted for corrupting industrial control systems. There was never a case like mine before. What I did that led to my crime and imprisonment, like that's not who I am. It's something that I did. If you see this mask, you probably recognize this one is in my videos. Whenever I go protesting at the Million Mask March, I'm wearing the silver mask. And people who look in there, they do see the reflection in Anonymous looking back at them because we are the people. Hmm. All right. Where did the name Ghost Exes come from? People have always asked me this. And the only answer I can give is that, think of it as an idea, like the idea of a ghost in a machine, uh, being able to, to, to move from one machine to the next undetected. So I was just like, Ghost Exodus, sounds like a really cool hacker name. I have been an explorer and a seeker my entire life. You have to understand like how I was raised as a small child to kind of get a clear picture of kind of like how I am today. So I was born in 1984 in Fort Worth. My father was a heroin dealer, my mother was a dancer. They were both very young parents, very irresponsible. And I guess you could say like, I didn't really bond with my parents. I didn't have an emotional connection with them. Um, and it may be said that they didn't really have that with me because of their own lifestyle. And I raised myself. You know, the survival aspect of like my early childhood, like I used the bathroom outside, I drank water outside, I ate outside. I had no sense of like relationships. I had no sense of like my environment. I was just very instinctual and just extremely wild, like something you couldn't console. I didn't know how to look normal. I didn't know how to talk normal. I was received in high school like someone who did not belong there. And so, like, I had never listened to rock music. I didn't even know what, what Metallica was. So, like, it was hard. My first taste of people in my, in my age range and my peers was just how nasty and they're like sociopaths. Trying to find new ways to, to humiliate you. Not being able to connect with my peers made me very isolated. That's when I first started really using the internet as my escape. When I found out what you could do with technology, that just changed my entire life. It completely affected the way I viewed technology. And of course, back then is when I was first exposed to the Hacker Manifesto, and it just perfectly encapsulated the mentality, the spirit of hackers in the Genesis era. It's something that we still quote to this very day because it's never going to change. There's a line I want to read to you. This, this really resonates with me. We exist without skin color, without nationality, without religious bias, and you call us criminals. You build atomic bombs, you wage wars, you murder, cheat, and lie to us and try to make us believe it's for our own good, yet we're the criminals. Yes, I am a criminal. My crime is that of judging people by what they say and think, not by what they look like. My crime is that of outsmarting you, something 
that you will never forgive me for. So in those early days, it was about vigilantism. But the problem is, is that when you're dealing with like cyber bullies, what you end up having to do is you have to become a bigger bully than the bully in order to, to get them to cease and desist. It just, it gets to you. It starts to poison that virtue and turn it into something that's, that's more about the ego and, and less about, you know, the mission. So knowing that you have the power to make someone's life better or to completely destroy them to the point that they want to kill themselves. Not to be a cliche, but it's, it feels like God. I have been moved from home to home. I needed to know like who, who my family really was. I needed to know who I was. And I had hired a detective to try to trace, you know, track down my birth mom. So, I mean, I found her. She was no longer like on drugs. She was no longer a dancer. She was evangelist. She was married to a pastor. She was a part of a big church. I wasn't spiritual at the time, but because I had a vast background in music, I started playing music for their church and became an integral you know, part of this ministry providing music. The ministry was led by a gentleman who was like a megalomaniac in every sense of the word. He micromanaged every aspect of your life, of my life. It was very invasive, but also it took away like free will and identity. So it felt very strangulating, being completely controlled to a degree where I can't even choose who I can date. I don't like to be controlled. Like, so I decided to create a, a new family, so to speak. I created the Electronic Tribulation Army. Inevitably, I ended up living two lives. In one life, I am a music director and youth pastor. On the other hand, I'm the leader of a hacking group. Some of the activities that we engaged in the ETA was combating cyberbullying, pedo hunting, and dismantling problematic hacking groups. As my group became, you know, started to be, get bigger and with, with more infamy and more fame and more attraction to our cause, I began to become a lot like my enemies while still doing these things, these noble causes, but they were less about like the victim and more about our, our infamy. One of the reasons why I was able to operate as much as I was and to manage a hacking group was because I worked as a security guard uh, overnight shifts at the Carell Clinic in Dallas. Now this clinic specializes in orthopedics and sports medicine. I'm a night shift security guard. There's nobody there. And by this time, our ETA group is at the height. Basically, we've reached our limit, I think, at this point. We had a botnet, right? We had a botnet and I'm already maxed out on what I can do. At the time, I'm working this job. I'm also a husband. I'm also a father. And I have a, a team of people who are who are supposed to facilitate things for us. And we needed to spread these bots, but also at the same time, we were dealing with Anonymous. Back then, the ETA was combating just a different kind of version of Anonymous that most people who are just arriving on the scene have no idea about. With so many members, and we're only about 50 people, but with only maybe 10 people active at any given time, we're dealing with international actors coming at us around the clock. With most of us though, we're in the United States. So at some point we're asleep. And when we're asleep, attacks are happening. And they became very personal. 
for example, one of my members, he ended up getting his, his email hacked with his court records leaked, which meant that his social security number, his, his name, his real name, his address, his phone number, and everything that was you know in his divorce records now becoming public, pictures of his child now being seized, downloaded by unknown actors, being photoshopped into inappropriate images to antagonize my member. Now things are very personal. Now we're talking, now we're receiving death threats. We're receiving rape threats against, you know, our children, um, against my wife. Now, now things are, 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 this is no longer about hacking. This is something else. Now, part of me is wondering, is this juvenile posturing? Is this something that I should just overlook? Because there, that is a, a thing that we experience when, when you're sitting on in, in chat rooms with people is, is just juvenile posturing. Is this serious? You, you, we don't know. We don't know. Until you know. So my solution to combating this problem was to use my physical access to these systems at the Crow Clinic in order to weaponize them and attack these actors, basically. Every 4th of July, the ETA has a holiday, a celebration called Devil's Night. That would be the day that we would celebrate our independence from the government, from tyranny and all this other idealistic, you know, stuff that like anarchists, you know, <laughs> idealize. So in my mind, in my manic, sleep-deprived mind, I'm thinking we need to make this idea viral. Spreading these bots for Devil's Night must be viral. Of course, we can't talk about the Corel Clinic, you know, computer breaches without discussing the video. It's Ghost Exodus. You're on a mission with me, infiltration. The infamous ridiculous and impossibly stupid video that I made, right? This is what it looks like with someone like, like me doing something like this. There is not a soul in sight, it's only me. And I'm going computer to computer, putting in this CD, uh, booting it, um, you know, booting this CD up as opposed to the operating system and it's completely autonomous. So it cracks the logins, tells me what the login is, and then I reboot the system again and log straight in and just, you know, start disabling or installing programs from there. Like I'm underslept, which I mentioned in the video. So I'm only sleeping maybe two or three hours every night. I'm jacked up on caffeine and sugar and I'm manic as hell. You put all those ingredients together, you get a dumb video, okay? <laughs> but that's, anyways, so I come up with this video and I want people to emulate and not only just emulate, but believe that I have the balls to do what I'm narrating. Like, I'm saying, oh, I've just broke into this corporation. And you know, we're listening to the Mission Impossible theme song in the background, it's playing, right? I've got my gray hoodie on, and I want people to believe that I just broke into a building. <laughs> Looking back, I just, I can't even, <laughs> I can't even fathom how I ended up thinking that that was okay to do. So, there was different times we were living in back then, okay? All the hacking videos were done by us, by hackers. And we made videos of us breaking into everything. It's just what all hackers did back then. But the only difference between that and what I did is we don't usually put our faces in the videos. I eventually get caught because I've got this new recruit in the ETA who's boasting about joining my crew on the security website or security blog of this uh, young man who is a network security researcher at Mississippi State University who is also working on his dissertation into SCADA systems. And what did I hack? Well, that heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, uh, air conditioning server is in fact a SCADA system. So it's like, it's like fate. I'm fated to get arrested. He is the one fated to make the phone call. <laughs> so I'd be driving on my way to work, listening to the pendulum, which is like this drum and bass, it's like electronic music. 
just to get me amped up and excited. Now here, we're about to enter the Corel Clinic, and now I haven't been here in almost, what, 14 years? Wow. Oh my God. Yeah, this is insane. So the night of my arrest, the first thing that I saw was what appeared to be a dark or a black van, and I just assumed it was the cleaning crew. Had I known or saw that that it was FBI, I would have ran. <laughs> I'm not lying. So, let's say it's the night of June 26, 2009. It's a Friday evening, and it's an hour before midnight. I've already done my routine. I drive around the building, and I park right in front of this, right in front of the sliding glass doors. That's when the FBI rushed me from, from that tower right there, tower one. So I'm coming in through the front door and suddenly I'm bum rushed by three FBI agents and two senior police officers screaming with guns, like safety's off, like freeze, like show us the gun, show us the gun, where's your gun? And I have no idea, I have, don't even have a moment to process what is happening. My first thought is that, is this a prank? Is this a prank? Like, am I being pranked? Am I being punked? Remember that show, uh, Punked by Ashton Kutcher? I'm, my mind is trying to grasp at straws because it can't even fathom that this could actually be the FBI and the police. And I'm screaming, what gun? I don't have a gun. And the, the one from your video. Like, which video? The one from your MySpace. I'm like, which MySpace? I'm trying to process like, oh my God, what's going on? I'm just thinking, is this about Ghost Exodus? Because now I'm just, things are starting to click. And, and they're like, well, I don't know, you tell us. Now a North Texas security guard is accused of hacking into a hospital's computers and posting video of it on YouTube for a short time. I was the first person in recent US history who was ever convicted for corrupting industrial control systems. There was never a case like mine before. It was the first. And so it created a, it set a precedence of what, you know, what would happen next to whoever did something like this. So I ended up being sent to Siegelville FCI. That's here in Texas. Um, my sentence was for two counts of transmitting a malicious code, it was nine years. I ended up doing a, a little bit more than that. <laughs> Taking someone like me who is not from the streets and throwing me into an environment with like child molesters, rapists, gangbangers, killers, like it was terrifying. Let me tell you, like it was terrifying. I didn't bathe for an entire week when I first got into jail um, because uh, we didn't have any privacy. There was nothing to make, you know, that showering thing, private. Um, I didn't even eat with general population f um, for over a week because I didn't know what to, what to expect. I didn't know what type of people I would be locked up with. And I had to learn like, this is a completely different reality. It's a completely different planet. Prison is, has, is nothing like anything out in the free world. And so once I learned to adapt, um, that's where I became you know, more safe and more confident and how I was going to spend my time. You know, for people like me in a system like that, they don't want any room for errors. So they restricted me from being able to email. So I was completely cut off from being able to communicate, maintain meaningful relationships, just isolated. And writing letters was the only thing I could really do. So I ended up working out a deal with another inmate to let me use his email so I could fight my case on appeal, right? That was a great idea considering how I was given one year below the statutory maximum of what they could give me. Um, he ended up getting caught and he told prison authorities that I had hacked his email account and that he had no idea that I was using it. So I was thrown into solitary confinement and what ended up lasting for 13 months. Um, 13 months in an 8x12 cell. 
And that was during the year 2012. We had the, the hottest heat index on record for Texas. It reached 125 degrees inside my cell without any AC, fan, adequate ventilation, and just dead heat 24-7. Um, we had people commit suicide on their first day. Talk about living through that. We had guards fainting from heat exhaustion outside. Imagine what we had to deal with on the inside. Since leaving prison, I have really made it my my goal to try to mentor the next generation and using my you know my experiences my skills my knowledge but also you know my insurmountable failures and all my mistakes that I've made along the way and try to kind of mold them to be more responsible so one of the things that I like to say and I might say it in a cheeky sort of way but you know hack responsibly um, that's what I want to see and I want them to not make those mistakes that I made because the consequences at this point in time they could be loss of human life and it could be their own lives prison is not a place for hackers we're not like other people <laughs> this was the very first hacking book I ever bought as a teenager and I went out and bought another one. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the one that started it all. One of the problems that we see a lot of in hacktivist groups is that we have goals that are good, for example, but the process of obtaining those goals or satisfying them ends up generating so much attention that it ends up creating a mob mentality where people are, are, are hacking or acting emotionally or instinctively and not thinking about whether or not this target is in scope. For example, right now we have Op Russia. Now, to get a general sense of what the goals of Op Russia are about is to punish Putin um, and to try to restrain their war efforts against Ukraine and disrupt it in any way possible. This is not a war that you can win regardless of how powerful you think you are. We are anonymous. We are a legion. Expect us. There is a group that I have recently seen just kind of like materialize out of thin air and I have no idea where it's come from or its members but their number one um, op Russia targets have been power plants and one nuclear power plant, which is home to about 65,000 people. And we had people, our operators from our group, go in and try to speak to them about the ramifications of, of taking human life by blowing up a power plant, it will cause global discussions about cyber attacks and usage every day. It could, it could very well create a new atmosphere for everyday users. And just to think, ending the lives of 65,000 or more people who had nothing to do with like the Kremlin, Putin, uh, Russia's attack against Ukraine, but people don't see it that way. Some of these people don't care if they take human life. It's the mob mentality that, that rules in the end. And I've seen, I just, I've seen it go only one way. Like you're just, you're going down, down. And that's just, it's really, when I look back at my life and I imagine how I will reflect on it, especially when I'm older, I don't want to see my life, you know, like a film reel where I'm just sitting in front of a computer year after year, day after day, month after month, you know, having spent my entire life just doing that. I just think that there's more that we have to offer ourselves, our relationships, our family, our loved ones. And if not, even, even like hacktivism than what we're really giving. That, that excitement 
to fulfill this, this need for excitement. The endorphin rush is like jackpotting and, and slot machines, like every hack is like a, is addiction. It was, a, it was an addiction for me, but that's, I just, it's consumed all my peers. I've always been a fan of the outdoors because I grew up backpacking and camping and hiking and rock climbing and doing outdoor things when I got a little bit older. Also having experienced cages for what amount to be about like 11 years of my life, a good chunk of my life being in prison and in cages, you know, it gives me a sense of absolute freedom. I don't like seeing structures. I don't like even living in a home. <laughs> I love the outdoors and there's something about it that like is very healing, makes me feel free. My actions, you know, that I, that I did, that I performed in this building was the death of my marriage. I never was able to raise my child and it changed all my relationships, restructured them all and it took me away from my family I mean it changed my entire life in a way that can never go back I could never go back and fix it and I wish I could for the sake of my child that's the only real regret you know that I carry is that I never was able to raise my child If I could hop in a time machine and go back in time to my younger self, even before I hacked the Corel Clinic, it would literally be these words, give up hacking. I would give up. I, I, it's a love-hate relationship. I hate it because it has consumed years of my life. And I love it because even though I hate it, it excites me. If I could give it up, what would I do? I would travel. I'd be a writer, I would travel. I, maybe I would pick up art or something, you know, be a painter or a sculptor, or just do something else that's more meaningful. But I would give up sitting in front of a computer so I could just have a normal life. I don't know how to have a normal life.